fight and we don't have to kill everybody in the whole wide world really just needs to chill no we don't have to fuss no 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 we don't have to fuss. hello everybody welcome back to another episode of just chill with oliver george this is episode number 39 And this week, I actually had the chance to sit down and talk to a very old friend of mine. But before we get to that, I want to remind you, if you're watching this right now on YouTube and you would prefer an audio-only version for whatever reason, you can access that on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc. Contrary to that, if you're listening to me right now and you didn't realize there was a visual side to the show, then please come check it out on YouTube. However you choose to enjoy the episode, though, I would really implore you to like, follow, subscribe, share, whatever the case may be on that platform. I'm trying to build this show from the ground up, and any support I can get really does mean a lot to me. So if you've already subscribed, thank you so much. And finally, if you want to contact me and reach out to the show for any reason, it's justchillpodcasting at gmail.com. Back to this week's episode, I, I sat down with an old friend of mine. His name is Terry Wildgust. We've known each other since high school, though back then I don't know if you would have said we were really friends. Uh, Our relationship has changed over the years, and now he's one of my best friends in the whole world. So it was really uh, a cool hangout. Normally I don't record on a Saturday night either, so we just kind of had, had a great time shooting the shit and talking about comedy, talking about parenting, his recent switch into being a stay-at-home dad, uh, which I can very much relate to. If you've watched this show, you know as well, I am primarily a stay-at-home dad. So it was a, a really great show and episode about gender stereotypes and, uh, and so, much, so much more. It was just a great time talking with him, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you. Well, thank you for stopping by, man. Uh, this is a little bit of a different style interview because you're one of my close friends and it's Saturday night. Normally I don't record on Saturday night. So I feel like I got a beer here. I got the vape. So I get to kind of chill with Oliver George. It's kind of, we don't get to chill as much. We get to chill today. So or tonight it's, it's way past my bedtime. Like it's bedtime already. What so you're lucky I'm doing 36. This yeah, on a Saturday night. Terry's almost you have dad, yeah. one. Um, yeah, no, the pandemic's been a fucking brutal uh, for just hanging out with friends, man. I know everyone's going through it, but we, at this age in our life, we don't have like an extensive group of friends that we regularly hang out with. But you and your wife, Christy, are yeah. like, you know, you guys came over for board game nights, I'd say at least like twice a month most of the yeah, time. Quite, quite often, yeah. yeah. No, nice, yeah. So, yeah, it's cool to be able to just hang out and uh, it will still be an interview, but, you know, it'll be more of a hang session as well. So uh, thanks for for coming by. You're an old friend. I would say a best friend. Yeah. Um, Your best friend, yeah. And before we get into like how we met and stuff, I, I want to talk about the most current thing that's happening in your life right now, which sure. I can totally relate to, which is you switching over to being a stay at home dad. Yeah, that's like. I'm so thrilled about this like opportunity to be a stay home dad. Like I get six months right now where I can, you know, be with both of my kids and my work is very accepting of that. And the wife goes back to work and she's making that full time money and I get to, to stay home and and do what I want to do. Kind of. Yeah. Much like me, your wife is a, a nurse. Yes. Also a nurse shift worker. So like, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was stressful on, on like the family life. And so like to now just be able to be like dinners on the table at five and like, I'll pack you a lunch, babe. Like, well, that's I, just the thing, right? Like people have such antiquated views on uh, the male and female roles in, in the family. And yeah. luckily that's shifting now, but there's still a lot of people that'll give you shit about that. Like I'll get that at work where people are like, Oh, you don't want part time. You don't. I'm like, yo, like I've told you 17 times. I have three kids. My primary focus is being a stay at home dad. And I have all this show and all that on top of it. But you know, like people, some people just still don't get it. They're so set in that mentality of like the man goes to work, the wife stays at home. And you know, so it's nice to see one of my friends in sort of the same boat and be able to relate on that level. Yeah, like my daycare provider just like can't can't fathom it, can't believe that like she's like, oh, like you you, you want to stay home, like yeah, like I want to stay home, like I'm very excited. I'm like, but it's kind of like insulting the way they they vibe it like that because it feels like they're saying like, oh, are your testicles you're, you're still intact? Like, provide, and I'm like, I I've, I work very hard at my job, so I have no problem uh, taking six months and, and working really hard at home as well. It's it's still it's a full time position. You know, you have three kids. I got yes. two kids. Like, it's yeah. not easy. Oh, it's crazy. It's so much work. Like by the end of the day, when I'm done with just the the dad stuff, 
it takes a lot of energy to get myself to, to edit videos or work out or, or all the other shit I want to do, you know, let alone hobbies. I haven't played board games at all since the pandemic started pretty much because partially we can't have people over, but just partially, I don't have the energy and time, especially yeah. with all the kids home from school now doing virtual school. And it's uh yeah, it's a whole other ball game, but people just still don't seem to wrap their head around it. Some of them. And, and it gives me so much respect for all the women who have been in those roles, historically speaking, you know what I mean? Not only were guys, you know, seen as, as the one that should go to work, but a lot of the time those same guys also didn't value what their wives were doing at home as nearly as hard as of work as what they were doing when they would go out the door, you know? Like it, it, it could also just be like simply, simply financially, like to, to just look at it financially, like we're going to pull my daughter out of daycare and I'm going to take care of the two kids and the, the wife makes far more than I make as a yeah. registered nurse. And, yeah, yeah. and like that, that's good money. Yeah. She's, she's the breadwinner. She's bringing home the bacon and I have no problem. I'm like very comfortable being here at home, raising the kids. And like, I still feel like I've done my work and I'm doing my work. But how, what's the transition been like for you? Because it's just like your first week of this now, right? Yeah, we did. We definitely did it in like stages. So what I did is I did a week with the wife and myself and my son only uh, to kind of get like used to what she expects of me to do. You know what she's she she sleep trained him and she's got all the yeah the, the routine. So it was yeah. like show me all the tricks and trades and then I'll take over. And so like it was a week of just the three of us. And then, uh, yeah, the wife went back to work. And so the next stage is, is kind of like just me and Toby and Chloe still goes to daycare. And then at the end of the month, bam, real full-time, real dad, two kids, no breaks, starts. Yeah, I'm not worried about you at all, though. I mean, no, any, no. anyone who follows you on Instagram, first of all, you yeah. have an amazing uh, handle on Instagram, which is 3.5 star dad. Yeah, it was part uh, of my comedy routine. Yeah, I give you at least four stars, though, personally. Well, it's, it's a joke. It's, no, it's I a know. Joke. <laughs> yeah, but uh, five star Dodge Grand Caravan type of get dad. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like the 2002 high end I accent of dads. Like, you know, I'll get you there and we'll crash, but you'll be fine. You'll walk it off. <laughs> You know, I'm a good dad. I'm a good dad. But not only that, but I mean, uh, the job you were doing prior to now that you're on this leave was yeah. sort of a typically stereotypically male job. You know, I mean, very uh, hands on, very physical. You were installing like garage doors and stuff like that, right? Yeah. So I worked for Ram Overhead Door Systems Limited or Les Pop Ram Doors. And they just they work on garage doors. And I've been very fortunate to work for them for the last like six years. And yeah, so lifting up heavy garage door panels, a very physical job. One of my jokes is even included in it where it's just like uh, the guys in my industry have uh, beards on their faces and cuts on their hands. And I go into like this whole like beard joke. And Oh, yeah, yeah I remember this. Remember the beard joke? Yeah. yeah. So. Well, so we should mention that then. I'm probably going to be jumping all over the place here because it's all kind of ties together. But yeah. you've done stand up a few times now. Uh, intermittently much like myself but four yeah, times, done on stand up yeah. four times so that's cool in itself because uh you did do the yuck yucks competition the, the weird the, the weird version that they did with the pandemic this year which was i guess in september well because here's what it was called it was the the yuck yucks presents mike mcdonald's comedy competition spring may possibly fall or yeah, summer yeah. possibly fall like it was a little wacky this year it was but. really hard to yeah, like get it all organized and my life was very kind of chaotic at that point as well so okay well actually before we jump into that let's let's just do your comedy path and trajectory it kind of ties in i think because you me and our respective partners we went to just for laughs a couple yeah, summers uh, ago yeah and that's a great memory for me i love that trip oh, absolutely. Um, the one and only time i've actually been to jfl but that was right before i was gearing up to launch this podcast yeah. we went to see kyle yeah. brownrig yes we did kyle brownrig got who that. ended up being my first guest ever and is going to be on next week after this episode with terry so a bit of a spoiler there um episode 40 big episode 40 is going to be kyle brownrig and you um, saw nick kroll while you were there as well yeah i actually went up and talked to him for two seconds just to say that i did um 
during the filming of that John Doerr episode at the yeah. Just Last Comedy Festival. Yeah, no, I remember that. That was awesome. The- so what I was going to ask you, though, is did that um, because I knew you had been to a couple shows before you had come to some of my shows that I had done and stuff. But did that trip to JFL really like light a fire in you as far as like wanting to give it a shot more? Sure. Yeah. Like it, it was like it, it was awesome to be like it felt like I was in the just for laughs scene because you were doing that one comedy at, uh, at your buddy's apartment. It was called comedy yeah. in the apartment. Show and, apartment. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. We, that was a fun show though. We, we drove to Montreal with like the intent of like watching you perform and like, yeah. it's, it's just for laughs festival. And it's all about comedy. So yes, it was like very alive in my mind that like, it's like comedy, like, man, like I could do this. And, uh, who else did we see just walking down the street? We saw two other famous people. We saw um, Anthony Anderson. Yeah. I don't know if I would call him a stand-up. I don't know if he does stand-up or not. He's a funny guy. Yeah, there was, um, and there Bobby was, Lee we saw Bobby as well. Lee, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's it's a crazy cool experience just to go to Just for Laughs during that time of year, obviously non-pandemic style. But um, yeah. so we came back from that. And then a few months later, I want to say it was in the fall, yeah. you... I, I managed to get a spot for you because I got a spot at this oh, turn. What turned out to be a curling club in oh, Renfrew. Yeah. In Renfrew. Yeah. Renfrew. Which I still have saved on my phone as Renfrew shit show because it was not one of my finest moments. I was like the feature act. One of the only times I got to be the feature act. And I don't think I did bad as far as like my material. I, d- I did all my jokes. I didn't fuck up. I didn't, you know, miss a punchline but I didn't, it was one of the first times where I had really like crickets. And part of that was the audience was all like, not a big audience. Yeah. Well, they were all like senior citizens for the most part too. And we were in a curling club couple that was there. Don't discriminate against the younger. Sure. sure. They were the minority though, as opposed to like, normally at a comedy club, you might have like one old couple, but this, Mm -hmm. I want to say everybody was like very, and they were very rural. So they were like, a lot of the jokes were like, right over their head if it well, was how about the cowboy that did his stand-up comedy bit there do you remember he was just that? stealing classic jokes it was, it was the joke that my father had told me like when i was a child oh, are you drinking the- uh no i'm drinking muskoka craft Muskoka. okay I, I do like yeah. that winter lion winter's ale though that's a yeah, good i couldn't one. believe that he did like the the newfie joke where he's like and then i sold my arm back on and i was like this is like my dad told me this joke when i was like 12 like well, what's worse is that he, he's passing it off as if it's his own too like it was not and i was like i was like i, I even think i like told you midway through i was like he's gonna do like one hand up yeah one you hand down, me, like you called this. i was like watch this and like he got to the end of like, his version of it and it's just it's anticlimactic i'm like that's that's not your joke like the jokes that i so told weird that, that night were like all original they were the jokes that i had written like inspired from probably even your first show on like April fools where mm. I like a long time ago. Yeah. A long time ago where I pretty much like met my wife and that's true. Yeah. Family that sure, I, I forgot about that. Now. Yeah, man. April fools. That was like your first show. We went to that and we left that together that night. So that was 2015. Yeah. I didn't know. I had forgotten that that was when you guys sort of, uh, yeah. Kind- you know, kindled your relationship. Um, sure. But anyways, back to the Renfrew thing, though. Yeah, that guy totally forgot about him. There was this guy wearing a giant cowboy hat and he was like telling all your grandpa's jokes and yeah. trying to pass it off like he was this amazing stand up comic that had made all these jokes. And and he killed it, too. That was the fucking most annoying no, they, part. They, they were country folk. They were they, they were digging his cowboy outfit. He was handing out business card. I struggled so hard to find the business card. I still have it from that comedy show, along with the half card that says, you know, like, what place are you going up in the lineup? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so oh, like nice. I, you kept a I saved souvenir. those little trinkets and stuff. And yeah, yeah. Who else was there? There was uh, we drove up with Dylan Parker in yeah. my SUV. We're gonna, we were going to drive in your little Hyundai. I was like, why don't we take the thing with the heated seats and ended up going yeah, down? No, I'm glad we took the there. ride. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, also saw, uh, we also we uh, also saw Tom Bird Hills. Really, I think but he was there. Georgia Silly was there. Georgia yeah, was there. yeah. Um, Tom Hills. Um, Fuck, uh, Peter Saran, maybe? I don't remember. But uh, I do remember it badly in my mind, just because, yeah. of again, that guy went up, I think, right before me, too, that cowboy guy, and he killed it with his stolen jokes. Right. And then I'm going up and kind of not getting the response I'm wanting, thinking, like, hello, original shit here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you want me to just get a joke book like a fucking Uncle John's bathroom reader? Is that what you guys want? Like, um, no. But anyways. So you know. 
<laughs> we can't all be amazing. Yeah, the unintentional boner or whatever it is. There, the yeah, I just did a, a few silly songs like I normally do, but it's stuff that had up to that point pretty much I wouldn't say like destroyed every time, but it had always gotten a positive response from an audience. And I did the furry song, which was like new at the time too, and I felt like the old people didn't really grasp what furries were. So as soon as as like the whole premise is out the window, then like doesn't matter. Your punchlines don't even matter anymore because if they're not on board with the concept, then you're fucked. But there I am still trying to fill my 15, 20 minutes or whatever. And I have to play it. So it was, uh, I know this uh, to anyone listening who is a comic, this probably sounds like, yeah, okay. You bombed or you, you did shitty or whatever, as if I'll that's such a normal that thing, but I don't do a lot of stand up. I've done a lot over, over the years, but I've never been Mr. Regular. So whenever I have gone, I've usually prepared my shit like crazy. I usually have the guitar, which gets people on your side. Some people call it a cheat, whatever, if you're actually good at singing. Um, but I haven't had a lot of those experiences. And I'm not saying that to sound cocky or like super talented or whatever, but I have a a set list and then like you, yeah, I prep really hard. I go and then I won't do stand up again for like two months sometimes or whatever it is. And, uh, but you can be sure when I come back again, I'll have a bunch of new jokes and they'll be well rehearsed for the most part. So that was the closest I've ever come to bombing where it was definitely a weird experience but anyways god this is supposed to be about you um yeah, we could talk about me bombing i i, I can tell you about like bombing. You did not bomb. that was no that was my last show you i don't think you were there for that no but the renfrew show was your first show and i before we pass on from that i did want to say that i got you like five six minutes or whatever i asked the lady like hey i got a buddy is it cool yep. if he he really wants to try because you had been talking about it you did this thing where like board game nights and dinner parties and shit for like months yeah. You were basically doing stand up, you just didn't want to take that plunge. And like, right. I would be like, Hey, man, just sign up uh, on the 15th. Yuck, yuck, yeah. school, I don't have an email. Yeah. Or like, you find every excuse. It's true, but like, l- look, like it took until the comedy competition, the Yuck Yucks competition, for me to like get back onto Facebook and get on Instagram because they're like, You need to advertise, you, you need a presence. Say, yeah, you need to say, Terry Wildgust is performing at Yuck Yucks at such and such a time and bring a, a, a guest. And, yeah, you know, there were th- things that I had to do to be in the competition and I wanted to be in the competition. And I, you finally had that motivation. I, and I like promoted myself. I was like, look at me, 3.5 star dad. Cause that was part of that, that was part of my bit. You know, I introduced myself. Hey, I'm Terry Wildgust. You can find me on Facebook. It's really fun to stalk people or like, go look at me on Instagram at 3.5 star dad. It's like, it's, it's my crash rating. You know, like I, I'd say the hand I joke and yeah. Yeah. No, it's nice that you work that in uh, because yeah. it is a good Instagram handle, but at the Renfrew show, I knew from when you went up and I saw it because I had never really seen you do it in front of anybody but just us at board game night. And it wasn't a huge crowd or whatever, like we already talked about. But nevertheless, I was really impressed with just like how natural the natural like stand up comic yeah. things that you had about you that I don't even think I have about me. Um, not to say all your material was perfect or anything oh, like no, that, no, but no, no, there was dead dog jokes i'm pretty sure in there that like i thought that was funny actually actually. and and like they're jokes like yeah you know but you but you powered through that's the thing is like a lot of people especially their first time ever doing stand-up because you had some jokes that got no laughs but instead of bombing or freezing up or whatever around the table yeah you just just fucking look at my notes and then it was right back out and i was like they don't like this like hit them with something else and you know it it did feel kind of it, it did feel a little natural like yeah, you had like a uh, coach, but. a natural public speaking aspect to you. You sort of paced the floor like a lot of comics do. You weren't, you didn't seem afraid of the audience, I guess is the easiest way to put it in a nutshell, which I think is not true of a lot of comics, even that are like well-established. I, I've like, Kyle's a good example. I talked to him and he, I remember saying like, oh, when does that anxiety shit go away? And he's like, oh dude, it never goes away. Like mm. I still get that, you know, but you honestly seemed kind of fearless. And I think that that's, one of the reasons I've always wanted you to keep going is because sure your material it, like anyone's can use work and development, but you have that knack for just, I don't know. I don't know what it is, man. It's just this stage presence that I think if you stick at it, you definitely will have a real shot, you know? No, I, I'm, I'm hoping to kind of like stick with it and maybe do another comedy competition or something like that. Cause like I did, I did bomb on my second performance. So like my first performance, I remember coming up and being like, dude, you made it like that was awesome. And you did so well. And I was like really, really happy. And I did make it through third place. Uh, yeah. We should tell people that's, it, it's like the audience vote. 
the audience vote. Yeah, but so. I would say being in the audience that night, even if uh, let's just say third place had been also judged by the judges, I think you still had that on lock. Yeah, I don't think the guy who was doing like the ventriloquism was gonna like take my spot or anything like that. Dude, but, that ventriloquist was like hard to watch. I think he had like limited mental capacity i'm not saying that to be mean no, i'm saying no, no, no. like it, it, it was true because like everybody kind of stood around just like where where's the fucking joke like please like we're yeah. here we're watching we're supportive but like you have, to, you have to give us something you have to give us something yeah to it like, was really uncomfortable yeah. it was like and there was not a lot of people making fun or anything but any laugh that was happening during that guy's set <laughs> especially during the back end you could tell that it was this uncomfortable, like laughing at the guy and not laughing at his material and him not wanting you to laugh at him, but actually laugh at his material. It was just kind of hard to watch, but no. uh, regardless, you made it through. So that must've been a huge, uh, I got my 3d photo that they put online. So like, if you really look real hard, you could probably find me on the internet other than like <laughs> instant Facebook. Yeah. But no, for your, that would have been your third time ever doing stand-up comedy. So Correct. to make it through a local comedy competition through the preliminary rounds, that's got to yeah. feel pretty fucking cool. It did. And like, you can't like ignore the fact that like, I was also going through like a, like life altering oh, family shit, yeah. situation at that exact moment. Yeah. You so, almost didn't go, right? You almost bailed on the show. Well, like I was writing my jokes and the jokes are like, and she gave me two kids and like my kid was like, in Chio, you know, it's like, is he going to be alive or dead? It's like, does the joke just end yeah. and give me kid? And I like, hmm, sad. And you're like, or kids. And you're like, eh, like, yeah. Oh man, like, that's real dark kid. times. Yeah, it was real dark times. So that's, that's uh, again, why I wrote notes, but I knew it was going to jump around because this all intersects with each other. But um, so, it, you know, explain in your own words, of course, this was your experience you went through, but um, we were there with you guys being close friends. I remember last summer, you guys, we're expecting your second child and you actually had different fears going in than what ended up being the actual for a heart surgery. Yeah. He was going to need heart surgery pretty much as soon as he came out. So Chio kind of knew that he was coming and they were ready to deal with this like heart condition that they had followed and said, you know, things will be fine. We'll do this little heart surgery and things will be okay. And he ended up having like a traumatic birth and, he spent the first like 15 days of his life at Chio before we could actually take him home. And it was really hard. Cause like, I was like busting routines, like in the delivery room with my wife, with this pink microphone in preparation for doing my uh, comedy competition. So I'm like dropping jokes and trying to be funny. Like nobody's finding it funny, especially my wife who's delivering our like child and, but you're trying to light, lighten the mood maybe, or, or yeah, but just, like, you know, that, take your mind like, off it. Like it was, it was just life. Like life was kind of like normal. It was like, yeah, he's going to have his heart surgery. Things will be fine. And I can do my comedy competition. And then it was like, well, you're really hit the fan, yeah. birth. he has HIE, he's got brain damage. Like, well, and, and strangely like, enough, the heart thing didn't even end up being a problem. Right. The, the, the day of the surgery, they did an additional x-ray and came in and said like we're not doing it it's not as bad as we thought it's doing what it needs to do it looks fine like the to do the surgery is, is it it wouldn't it wouldn't have been worth it like you don't want to have to cut open a brand new no baby. of course well, that's just so <laughs> fucked because yeah. i i remember us stressing for you guys about this heart thing and then all of a sudden there was like this this brief window of like oh he is not going to need the heart surgery anymore and then yeah everything else happens, which was yeah. completely out of left field. So, yeah, I mean, and like you can't plan for that. And like, even like the more that we find out, it's not like, it's not, it's not good news, but mm. like it's news. It's like, I, I was trying to like write a joke about it and be like, you know, you know how terrible, like it is when Bell's like, you know, we'll give you your, your window where your technician will show up. It'll be from Monday to Wednesday between eight and four. I hope that works for you. And you're like, well, that doesn't. And they're like, here's your kid back. And you're like, oh, great. What's wrong? And they're like, we don't know. We'll get back to you in eight or nine to 18. And I'm like weeks. And they're like months. And I was like, oh man, like, months. Like you have to wait 18 months to figure out like how, how he's going to progress. And they're like, oh no, yeah. no, you live in Canada. We did the most expensive genetic testing that they can do provided by Chio and all the stuff there. And so he's got a, a rare genetic mutation and it's going to get, I know the other night, 
You were you were like, making some X Men joke about this. I did make an X Men joke where it was like the doctor comes in and they're like, "Oh, like he's it, it's it's not from the mother and it's not from the father. It's uh you know this weird genetic mutation." And I was like, "Did it? Did it? Did it? Did it? Did it? Like it will more than likely cause like autism or like ADHD and like things like this." I'm like. Enthusiastic theme song. It's 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 funny, but you're not getting good news. It's uh, yeah, no, but that's very admirable that with such a heavy situation, you're trying to find the humor. And I remember the other night you were telling me some jokes that about your son and some of his issues, and you were doing it in in a way that you were worried like. Will some people find this like offensive or whatever? Like he has a job as a doorstop at Baskin and Robbins. Like this is a joke <laughs> that I'm working on, and like it's offensive, it's super harsh. But like, really, what's a baby going to do? They're going to sit there and they're going to be a doorstop. And like people try and bring him in, and you're like, no, 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 that's Toby. He works at Baskin and Robbins. Like <laughs> other yeah. equal opportunity hire. Like we just can't find a visor in baby size. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you got to look at the the lighter things because that's a heavy ass situation to be in. And yeah. it's not like he's going to understand the joke and it's not like you've even done that on stage yet, but I'm not but, like being mean. I'm just like, like, this is literally my life. Like, that's helping you process your own trauma that you're dealing with for sure. Yeah. Emotionally, that's, you need to work through that stuff. And if comedy is the way you do it and then you manage to make other people laugh at the same time, then that's win-win as far as I'm concerned. But um, yeah, okay. So damn, I totally forgot that when you were doing the Yuck Yucks competition, you were dealing with that. The timing was like, right and like on. There was a joke the whole time. So like, uh, I was listening to your podcast. There was not a lot to do, but sit and watch him at Chio. And uh, so like, I gave him his own podcast. It was called Stuck in the Bed. And he's like, hey, uh, another day uh, stuck in the bed here. Uh, I got the nurse and they'd write their name on the wall. So we'd say uh, nurse, whatever, Kelly, we'll use example. Is yeah. And it's like, I'd like to thank our sponsors today. If you name off whatever it says on breathing apparatus. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we always just kept it kept it light like it's it's very it's very heavy so well and especially with what you were saying about how a lot of it is uh you know this longevity thing where you're not going to have all the answers all at once it's going to be sort of drip fed to you and you kind of have to keep rolling with the punches so it's it's nice to see you guys already trying to adapt to that and and your kid looks cute as hell and he looks happy (laughs) you know so don't take a real good look at his head he's got like the Porta Collis or something like that. His head's a little the, squashed. The, you know, the flat head at the back. Yeah, yeah but a, lot of, a lot of babies get that though. From like the, a traumatic birth, he was taken out with uh, the, the forceps or whatever. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah tra- traumatic birth. So, but, but uh, we do all this physio. We we're really happy that you know I'm fortunate enough that now I get to go do the physio with him. So we just got a crash mat today, like a big like gymnastics mat and. We do all this physio and it's, it's nice that I get to kind of be involved and like, of course. I, I, I'm taking over for these six months. Like it's going to be really important. It's we've had great progress in his neck and his, uh, his muscle tone, which is one of the issues he's got. Yeah. His uh, torso area, right. Is well, like back. the neck and the head and neck and stuff like that. Like you want your baby to be able to like hold the neck up and they should be able to look left and look right. And right now he's just kind of like stuck over at the right. Like the, the flat spot doesn't help. Yeah. He's That's also, true, like, yeah. it's like, just, I don't know. Just, it's always... <laughs> Instantly goes back. Yeah. Or you that, like, oh, looks like the... <laughs> but that's like where so much comedy comes from is from these like dark, you know, stressful, emotional periods that people go through. So yeah, I really hope that the pandemic's over soon and you can get on stage with some of this stuff as he continues to develop. Cause you're going to keep getting curveballs, I'm sure with mm-hmm. his health stuff, but um, I think he's got a really great dad. And I think that uh, you guys are going to be just fine. Well, not to say he doesn't have a good mom, but you know what I mean? I, I'm, no, I'm no, happy no, to like, see you. But, but it's, it's me right now. It's like it's, it, mom, mom is a, a frontline worker. She's registered yeah. there. She's out there. She's doing her job. And, and I feel like very honored that I get to kind of stay home. You know, like yeah. the, and the, the global pandemic did not treat me well. I had to be like 38 years old and decided I'd go seek counseling and, You know, like it's it's stressful to have, you know, two kids and. Well, this also kind of ties into um, our our friendship and and just going back before we were like really friends is that I would say that you 
when I, okay. So to tell everybody, we knew each other in high school, but you were a few years older than me. And we had a couple mutual friends and you were a guy I bought weed off of mainly. That was when I was in grade nine, it was like, I discovered weed. And then all of a sudden I just wanted weed all the time. And I would, I was getting like allowance from my parents. I didn't have a fucking job. I was like 13. Um, so I was, you know, taking my $10 vacuuming allowance or whatever. And that would go pretty quick. So in my mind, I was like, Hey, what's, what's wrong? This guy like has weed. I want to give him money. But you're like, this motherfucker keeps coming to buy five pieces, like $5 mini half grams. And uh, at one point, my, uh, our mutual friend told me that if I asked you for a, a five piece again, you would like bust my face in or something like that. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, that's high school, man. Like, no, no, I'm not trying to make you seem like a dick. I was more going to tie all this into, um, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say that you had like a, a machismo vibe, which I think was very common in the late no, 90s, early 2000s. There wasn't as much acceptance to males being sensitive or stay at home dads. All this kind of ties together, yeah, you know, like to be a, a younger brother, to be like a kind of like a, a shorter kid. Like, mm. you know, it, you, you do what you can to like stand out. You, you try and be cool and act tough a little bit. Yeah, act tough a little bit. Yeah. So. But you, I mean, I feel like you've changed in, in drastic ways. Like you, you okay. had mentioned going to counseling and I feel like you're starting to really open up to that more sensitive side of yourself and um, not having to, you know, be that man's man or whatever vibe you had when you were younger. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I, I can remember this is, this will like really put me on the spot. Like I remember just listening to Tracy Chapman's fast car driving into work and just for some reason, just like start like crying and stuff. And it's like, dude, like you need to like sort yourself out. Oh, that's some shit. Yeah. yeah. Like you're like, this is not right. Like I got a ticket to anywhere. And it's just like, like <laughs> you're like, yeah. yeah. So, you know, to, to, to get counseling, I would, it's, it's been really great for me. And like, not just, my own counseling my my wife gets counseling we get couples counseling like we went for like lactation consultants we went to mom's groups like the any anything that was like help uh i probably was was down for it like you know it's therapy is super healthy and a lot of people don't want to engage with it because there's uh, you know this vibe that if you go to therapy you must be crazy or something and some people i'm sure are in that point where they're bordering on crazy but there's plenty of healthy people that go to therapy too, just to learn new uh, <laughs> mental, I guess, tricks for lack of a better word to, you know, alleviate anxiety or whatever your, your particular depression, whatever your, your yeah, struggle like, may be written on the fridge. It's like how to like ask a question. Like I've been asking the question wrong for the last, like, you know, six years with my wife, you know? Right. So, oh, you mean like, yeah, you, you always have to um, phrase it from your perspective <laughs> of like, when you do this, it makes me feel as opposed to being like, hey, why do you do that? Like, and always yeah, like, putting the blame. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, That's huge. Yeah. But I wouldn't have done that before. I don't know this stuff. I'm just like a normal guy. So it's yeah. nice to, to, to sit down and somebody be like, come on, dude. Like, you can, you can ask a question properly. You can ask it without being like angry or petty or mean or any of those things and just, uh, communicate because really that's what it's about it's about communicating so it's if I, if I got a problem it's not like oh, she's not listening it's like well you didn't you didn't present it to her right you didn't yeah. give her a question properly because maybe she doesn't want to talk about it and then maybe you can talk about why she doesn't want to talk about it and you're like oh, okay like oh yeah so no considering the other person moments yeah so it's good considering the other person's perspective is such a huge part of like proper communication too and yeah. it's something everybody struggles with everybody's the protagonist in their own story or whatever, you know, and it's very hard to shift gears and try to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, even someone you're really close to, especially if you're at odds about something, you know, but um, yeah, that's good to hear, man. I'm happy that uh, you're moving in that direction, you know, but uh, I would say I would, I would be really excited in a lot of ways if I could be going to high school in this day and age, because I feel like, when we went to high school, you know, I was 99 to 2003, um, which makes me probably sound really old, but I felt, you know, I wasn't good at sports. I wasn't good at masculine type stuff. And, and back then maybe it was a complex I put on myself, but some guys were huge dicks about it. So like, it, it wasn't just it, me. It probably mattered a little bit more back then, like for yeah. sure. So, like, Whereas now I feel like people are, are much more uh, younger people, I should say, are much more open-minded and artistic and sensitive and an artsy school. Colonel by was, was a decent school for like the arts and 
Yeah. I mean, I didn't hate my high school experience. I always found people that I could get along with, but that was mainly through weed. I found like, and that's how I met you probably, or I, I did, but eventually I, I feel like we started sort of chilling. Um, no, it was just like going to like house parties and stuff at, at your place. And I was uh, living with uh, Dan and Nick. Oh, and that's so true. Yeah. There was probably a connection there as well. That just like kind well, of this... closer. And then it's just like, Hey, we kind of like really work well together. Like, you know, and I'd, I'd come to your comedy shows and you support my comedy shows and our yeah. wife, both nurses. And we like, we both have like young kids around the same age. So it, it did kind of just really work out well that like we came back enough times that like we built a good friendship on it. Yeah, yeah no, it's been a great experience. And, and it's just weird because if I would tell myself like when I was whatever, when I was in high school that like you were going to be one of my best friends when we were grown ups, I wouldn't have believed you. I would have said like, and you probably wouldn't have either. Probably not. I would have been like, <laughs> that, no, that no. wiener. Yeah, Ex exactly. But it's like, it's like, well, like, <laughs> Like what, what makes me less of a weeder? Like I'm, I'm probably just as much of a weeder. It's just, yeah, no, you yeah. were cool. You did like snowboarding and you were just like much more of a, a cool guy than I was, I think. Yeah. But I mean, like I, I definitely try, tried to be. So like, it wasn't, it wasn't I remember. Like, yeah. I just remember having a, a standoffish feeling from you back then. And then even, even when we started to hang out in our later years now, <laughs> there was a bit of tension at the beginning, but I feel like, you've just like grown a lot as a person and, and our friendship has grown a lot. We've changed completely. Yeah, definitely. Like I'm, I'm much more just like honest and stuff like that. And then yeah. it, 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 it feels better. I feel better, you know, like it, it did feel better to like go to counseling and get some help. And like, you know, like that the first child was, was not easy. And, yeah. You guys had colicky and, yeah, and all colicky that. Colicky baby. And like my wife had, postpartum depression and that like really affected i was working full-time shifts and coming home and like you know, like nothing was done like you had to, i had to cook dinner and do this and i eventually ended up uh, kidnapping or uh, abducting i think they call it these days my mom and trapping her in my basement to like save our family like oh shit to, like sleep train the child so that christy could get sleep so that i could still go to work and like you know, it's yeah. insane. Honestly, people who don't have kids don't know what it's like. I mean, I didn't have a colicky baby, but even with that, I've still found newborns. It's so hard, man. Like two people trying to get as much sleep as they can, alternating to the point where you barely see each other. And you're like, are we even friends? Like, are, are we even like communicating? Because I feel like we're just shift workers being like, hey, Carl, or whatever, you know, like, and then you give them the chair and you go sleep. It's I don't know. It's it's fucking crazy. And I can only imagine with a baby who's crying all the time from colic that it's yeah. gotta be like, it was, it was, it was awful. Like I kept recordings of it on my phone to be like, uh, to remind us to like not have another kid too quick. <laughs> not because they say like, Oh, like you forget it and stuff. I was like, we will not forget this. Like, wah, wah, wah. It was constant. And it, it literally drove her to madness and you know, it, uh, put a big strain on our family. And as I said, like I, I genuinely kidnapped my own mother and locked her in the basement so that like I could still go to work and our family could still survive, you know? So. I'm hoping you didn't genuinely kidnap her where you like put a like, bag over like, her head and threw her in a van. <laughs> read a book in the basement. She had a nice rocking chair and she would just sit outside of the room and then listen to the 20 minutes of crying and then they fall asleep. It's that's what's no, so but I, I mean, she wasn't like, trying to like send there was, there was no, messages was like no save me on her ankle no no so uh, i'm very grateful for like the family support that i got like not only through like needing it with like kids and stuff like that but also with my comedy like the amount of support that i got i, I maybe got that audience voice or uh, vote because of how many people I brought to the comedy competition that night. Like, yeah, I wouldn't say you were like a bringer. Like I, I did a show where one guy brought like 30 people and I was like, okay, this is a little ridiculous when the audience is like 50 people during a pandemic, you're obviously going to get through, but you're gonna get through. whatever yeah. I digress. But um, I think, yeah, you had a nice handful. There was maybe like, I'd say it was like less than 10 though. It wasn't that crazy. Yeah, it's, it's not like I like, you didn't like load the, the house or anything. I didn't, yeah, I didn't buy the house or whatever you just said. Yeah. There. Like, no, you did a good set. And that's another thing I would say, b besides you having sort of a natural stage presence, and I think a lot of the things that are important in comedy, you also, and, and don't go into this if you don't want to go into this, but your like big closer was 
yeah can, can we discuss this or no like go for it yeah like i said so been- terry invited his wife's sister and brother to come they were Ooh. front row front row center yeah and i don't remember the joke exactly i just remember that it it, it was on, it was about breasts and about yeah. Like, oh yes 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 like, and your daughter seeing mommy change or something right? mommy change seeing the boobies and she was a complete narc and she is always just like telling people what we say i said like, oh mommy has nice boobies mommy has nice boobies so she tells people she goes oh auntie beth auntie beth mommy has nice boobies and i think the closer was, was like i'm so glad i never told this little narc chloe my daughter <laughs> that it's actually Auntie Beth that has the nice boobies because she would just think so, back like, oops. Oh like, oh, like, <laughs> still, I think this is the only other time that I've actually said the joke out loud because like... Well, no, that's what I mean. I couldn't believe you said it. Yeah. Uh, like if she wasn't there, I could be like, all right, like that's whatever, you know? Oh, I made sure she was there. Exactly. Was, that's uh, what blew my also mind. also confronted by Georgia Silly who actually ended up winning that comedy competition where he used her as his like... Uh, to, to to do his machismo uh, yeah yeah his line. whole bit about like and, how to talk to a like, woman bitch and he just like <laughs> stared at her like that's front row though you get in the front, front row. row i know but like she really she, she really kind of like stepped it up and then took one for the team and yeah came to the show and didn't know it was gonna and happen. she had no idea you were gonna say no, that to no, her I, I was i was writing that joke in the chio <laughs> hospital while i was like the pink I, I had to make six minutes so i had to make sure that i knew what it was like to hold a microphone and talk with the microphone and give six minutes. And I was like, oh, this is her closer. And like it, the wife's sitting right there. Like we spent our days at Chio. Like uh, we'd go home to, to sleep. Oh, so Christy knew you were going to do the joke. She knew I was going to do the joke, but okay. she didn't know like the joke. It was, just, Oh no. <laughs> she just, she, she didn't know that the, 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 the punchline. She yeah. just, Oh, mommy has nice boobies. Mommy has nice. Oh, boobies. so she knew the buildup, but not. And there, and there was also some hand gestures that went along with it. I yeah. mean, maybe wait till I perform another show, come and see me. And yeah, for sure. No, I, I was only bringing it up because of, I think it feeds into that classic stand-up comedian. Um, some of the stuff that I don't feel that I possess, which is like, I would never ever be able to say, I mean, my, my, uh, fiance, I call her my wife, but my wife doesn't uh, have a sister, so it doesn't really apply, but let's just say she did. I would never be able to say a joke about her boobs or her sister's boobs rather while her sister is like right there staring at it. So I don't know. I just gives you this, um, I don't know, gunpowder on stage or something like, I feel like you're like kind of a loaded cannon. And I think that that people respond well to that in comedy. And I did like, I like, and you have to hold on to that joke. And it's like, as I said, like, that's only like the second time that I really like bring it out and like talk about it. Cause it's the, the guy who, the host who took the microphone, he's like, Oh my God, this guy is like preparing for his divorce. Like, I can't believe he just said that. Like, <laughs> You don't say that stuff. Well, I almost didn't want to bring it up here because I don't want to like. No, um, but like I, I wanted to get the shock value. I wanted to to like make the joke that like. No, I just mean if Beth watches where, this, or, or Chloe, goes to, Chloe goes up to to Christy and goes, "Auntie Beth has nice boobies," and it's just like I, I would be dead because that means that I said that, like you know. Yeah, so, yeah. But, uh, it, it was worth it. I feel oh, it, was it was funny, worth. and uh, you did didn't have any like fear about doing it. i could tell you just went all in and it worked and then you know for your third time ever doing comedy making it through a competition that's awesome yeah but then you you told me the story of the follow-up oh, uh, which i was not oh. able to attend but it sounded yeah. fucking brutal so that was your first time bombing this, this i guess is, this is an earplug so i did uh, my fourth set uh with an earplug in my left ear I, I get a lot of ringing and so i like i'm just gonna put this earplug in it's too loud in the club and when i go up on stage i'll take it out and i forgot to take it out and i was just like i i did this i'm like tapping on the mic i can't hear anything so i got an earplug in. so i'm like screaming at the crowd and i've also rewritten eight minutes worth of material so instead of just sticking with my six minute set that like got me through and adding a couple minutes and adding a couple minutes and yeah. also while like you know like your, your kid just got back from the hospital and like you're like yeah. the stuff so i in, in like i think it was less than 15 days i worked up a new eight to ten minute set yeah why did you do <laughs> why, why would you do that i don't know because uh, i'm not experienced well, because it was your fourth time ever doing comedy yeah. yeah i sat down next to janelle niles and she's like oh like i really liked your set i'm looking forward to it and i was like 
You're like, I'm doing a new one. I have a new set. And she's like, she's like, you don't do that. And I was like, like, fuck man. Like I'm screwed. I, I, I practiced, I practice. I, I, it's drilled into my head. I can't just edit, delete and put my old six minutes back in my head. Yeah. The last two weeks have been nothing but me trying to prepare. It's funny though, because the only time you don't do that is in a competition. But any other time, if you're just doing a random night, like I'm very much like you, that's one of the reasons I don't do it as often as a lot of other comics is because I want to take the month to write a bunch of new shit because there's a joy and a, and a fun vibe to just telling new jokes that are new to you too. I love that feeling. I love seeing like, Oh, I don't totally know if they're going to like it. Like there's, I don't know. It's a little bit boring if you do the, the competitions and then you're doing the same six minutes or whatever it is. Um, that's how you get good for sure. And that's why I'm not a headlining right. comic. No. Um, and I, I would love to have a six minute set. If I could just go back and just do my yuck, yuck, six minutes and then just pile on two more minutes of additional jokes that I like, didn't think cut the mustard, but you need to fill the time. Add in. Yeah. Add in. I, I think, I think, you know, I don't think I would have won, but I, I wouldn't have bombed. You wouldn't have atrociously bombed. Yeah. I atrociously bombed, man. It was awful. Like, well, the earplug uh, wouldn't have helped you. Even if your set was great, people would still have been like, why was this guy yelling the whole time? Why was he yelling us the whole time? Oh yeah. And like, I, it didn't feel good. I like, I like drew the number like six and I was like, yeah, man, you're closer. Like you got this. That's a like, good spot too. Six is fine. Right? And the other people are like, who's this guy? Like he just got six. Like, yeah. And then I went up and sh- shit the bed like they're like oh phew like, and that fucking sucks for seven to be well i mean it could be good or bad but they have to kind of like yeah i think yeah. it was uh was the trevor from uh, trevor's pad there the comedian and oh he followed you well like, he was like i guess like the the, the big act after the oh no i meant whoever run after you in the in the competition that could kind of suck because if you've got a room and I it's going really going and everybody's if everybody's laughing and the momentum's going and then you bomb yeah. Um, sorry, I cut you off. I, it's, I, yeah, I thought there was only six people that performed that night. So I, I, oh, I you were like, last. Then. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Shit, man, that's even exactly worse. just bombed. It took a yeah. golden opportunity and just bombed it. And and I'm fine with that because like you're well, gonna because bomb. fourth time doing comedy and right. any comic will say that you need to bomb a bunch of times and that's part of the process and that's part of how you gain yeah. that armor of not giving a fuck. <laughs> Yeah, because we can go to like comedy at any's. Like, if you want to talk about that, I don't know if you want to talk about it later, but like, oh. that was my. So, the most- second time you ever did comedy, again, an interesting story because that was when I randomly got the opportunity to interview George Strombolopoulos. Right. And I felt so bad because Janelle, it was the night of, like, I literally yeah. confirmed that interview at about 4 30 or 5 p.m. with his agent. Right. And we had to go pick him up at the airport and all that. And the show that I was supposed to be doing was at like 7.30 or 8 or something. Yeah, and you're supposed to show up early to like... And she told me that she had already had one or two people that had to bail. So I was like, that made me feel even worse. Right. I know, um, you're so torn. I even wrote about it on Facebook recently there, but like it was... Well, it wasn't that torn because it was Strombo. I was going to do it, but I felt like a dick. It was such a big name, literally. And uh it was an opportunity for me. I was in that mood where it was like, say yes to things, man. Like, you know, nice. like you want to do some comedy. I was like, I could, I could do six minutes. I could, I could do six minutes. And I yeah. just I rolled in and yeah, you filled in for me. We should uh, say, yeah. I filled in for you. Yeah. Uh, Chris uh, Kingsbury was there. Uh, his, his Mike LeBlanc. Yeah. His buddy, uh, Mike LeBlanc. Uh, I'm trying to think who else was on that show. Issues. Um, I don't, it was the daddy issues. Oh, Matt champ was there then too. Probably. Yeah. It's so like, it was a really, really nice experience. I don't think I like killed the room or anything like that, but I enjoyed, you know, sitting with the comics, talking with the comics outside, being able to, 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 to do six minutes of comedy and stand up and perform. And not I, felt like I was do, doing you kind of solid. I was like, Oh man, don't let Oliver feel bad. Like you're the type of person that's like, Oh, I feel bad that I, you know, I, I confirmed with Janelle and you're like, you did. And I think he gave a nice, filler yeah I yeah george but i was that was such a nice solution i was so glad that you did it because i remember being like okay now janelle won't be mad at me and i'm helping terry get a spot oh yeah no we weren't really like experience yeah yeah man no that's and it, it, we should say again eddie's is such a great place if you're in ottawa post pandemic uh, i'm sure they'll still keep doing the show there i hope so <laughs> it's a very 
small diner with great food and it's kind of like a hallway almost but yeah. it's cozy and it's it's like just enough people when it's full yeah they've uh, always like stuck to like their covid protocols and whatever the city says to do they've been doing and everything like that to stay open and keep comedy kind of going in ottawa so like shout out to janelle again i will say though um yeah. i never went to any of the covid shows there and i i would not to shit on them but i would imagine it's got to be like barely any audience then because the, so but like wouldn't that be nice to be like full house tonight and you're like we had 12 people <laughs> like full house and like you could advertise it as full house you know we had true couple and they came Although during a pandemic full house is probably not something you want to advertise right it's like you no know, if, if you're like it, it's about following the capacity guidelines it's about following the hand washing orders and the plexiglass and, and the masks and yeah, yeah. yeah so it's like really it doesn't matter that there's only 12 people in there. I, th I think it, if you're allowed to have 12, congratulations, 12 people, full house, you know? And those are fun shows sometimes, especially if you're trying out material and stuff, you don't want to try out material in front of 60 people necessarily, especially if you're on the more amateur level like us, where you're not really like, yeah. you know, um, super, super high in the com comedy stratosphere or whatever, you know, even to this day, I don't feel like, uh, I, I, I watch myself calling myself a comedian. Like I will, because I feel like I've earned it because I've done enough shows and I've had enough good gigs and I've not bombed very often. And I've had like, you know, a lot of positive experience where I was like, okay, I can call myself a comedian, but I recognize that I'm in no way a professional comedian. I'm not even really a headliner. Like it's uh, those, I have so much respect for people who do this shit for a living and they can do like a 45 minute set and fucking destroy yeah. I still enjoy being in the audience more than I enjoy being on stage. Cause there's nothing like a pro just laying it down. Yeah, no, I've really like enjoyed all the kind of like comedy that I've been involved in and been able to witness, whether it's you performing or whether it's, uh, you know, like Michael Lipschitz, like here's a good one. I don't know if you remember this one, the crumb club, crumb club, the, the crumb club, mm. his basement. Oh shit. Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you. I totally forgot about this. So like, this was uh Paul crummy. Yeah. And it was, I think in Barhaven or something. Well, like Michael Lipschitz make uh Lipschitz made it out that night. And like, Oh my God. Jamie Villeneuve. You, you were hiding in the, in the back corner on that comfy couch. And, yeah, and this it, up, yeah. Oh my God. Remember? It went from the crumb club to the. Okay. No, no. We got to preface this by explaining a little bit. So Paul, Paul crummy local comedian. I don't know if he still does it or not. I haven't talked to the guy in years, but a few years ago he yeah. invited me to perform at, he was like, I'm going to do a comedy show in my laundry room. And yeah. this was pre pandemic. This wasn't like, Oh, we need to, cause there's no clubs. This was like trying to be that weird alternative. What, you know? Um, but I got to say the setup was actually decent. It was, it, you know, Fox you could TV sit and, uh, as many TV people as like Eddie's. And yeah, absolutely. And like, yeah, that was, probably, got a pretty good that was probably a 12 person full house. Like it was, it was nice. Like, uh, I mean, but the, there was the, drama that night because I did not perform. Well, okay. Yeah. I went, uh, and sat up in the back in that sweet spot and everybody was having a good time. And there was a couple of older, like, I don't want to say cougars, but like that age range of like, Correct. Yeah. Like some name Judy or I can't remember, but it was fucking hilarious. Just like the, the randomness of the whole thing definitely did make it funny. Like I understood why once I got there, why the laundry room thing was funny because he actually put up a nice sign and it kind of looked like you were in a comedy club and you had to remind yourself like, wait, I'm in someone's fucking laundry room right now. Oh yeah. Like there's a and, big, uh, huge silver furnace like right next to him. It's like, put a blanket. But you forgot. Him. You forgot because it felt like a comedy club. As soon as the show was going, like he yeah. had good comics and yeah. it was comfortable um yeah. and we were drunk so it was I know. like a comedy club i i feel like I, I need to bring it back up the the one where we were at the, the apartment and the just for laughs uh where you did your your set there and i remember just going up after the show was over and just grabbing the mic and just kind of pulling up my phone and telling jokes and just like and no just, one was paying attention to you no, nobody was paying attention to me they're all it wasn't plugged wrong. in or anything it wasn't point. plugged in or anything but i just picked up the mic and i wanted to like see and you came by and you're like you could have probably asked him to do five minutes or yeah. five minutes. And I kind of read, I kind of read the jokes off of my phone and it would have been like the first time I did comedy. So and and you I, weren't I, quite there yet. And I remember doing the same thing at the crumb club down in the basement. It was just like, Oh, like everybody's leaving. And I just like, kind of like stood where the mic was and, and tried to like 
look this way. For yeah. Yeah. And it like, it'd be like, Oh, okay. Well, visualize like, the experience to do, to do comedy, yeah. get to look out at the 12 people and, and tell them your jokes. And, but that's and the, the, the as well. The best advice to anybody who thinks that they want to try a stand up is go watch a bunch of stand up because it's not like watching a stand and stand up special on Netflix in a big theater with like 5,000 people. When you start going to clubs that are like 40 people in the audience or whatever it might be, it's, there's an intimacy about it. That's really um, alluring, you know, and seductive. If you're that kind of person that you're already kind of thinking about, Oh, that'd be, that'd be fun. Or I've watched stand up my whole life and I've always really enjoyed it. Yeah. Once you go to enough live shows, you'll just, you'll also see enough shitty people that you're like, I could have done better than that. Right. Not like I'm great, but I could do better than that guy did. Yeah, you, you remember you know? at that Montreal show, that guy was just horrible. He was just sexist, mm. and like, like terrible, terrible jokes. And like, I could have just stood up on stage and told one of my family related jokes and it might've like gotten a laugh or something, but yo, dude, that guy was so uncomfortable. I'm not going to say his name. Cause I, I don't personally know, like, don't remember, but that guy went on right after me. He was like the actual headliner. And I should say, when you said JFL show at the apartment, it is was in no way connected to just for laughs. No, 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 no. I got these fun like reboot pins. And oh yeah, another, Matt Shuri. He's got another, a super another fun one like was. Do you remember how upset you got at me when I was like, "Oh, it's the three little ducks and uh, Launchpad McQuack," and you're like, "You can remember Launchpad McQuack, but you can't remember Huey, Louie, and Dewey." And I was like, yeah, really? "Sorry, dude." Like, that's you're so, so much yeah. good nerd in, in, in that way. Like, that's I, like remembering that the dog from Frasier was Eddie, but not remembering any of the cast <laughs> members from Frasier. <laughs> like uh, Neil, I think. No, it's Giles. <laughs> I, I think the skinny one was Neil. Yeah. 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 Um, no, that was uh, that fucking headliner, though, was it's good when you see stuff you really don't like. And not just because I don't think he didn't do well, like he really it was crickets. But um, also, I just remember being like, wow, I never want to be this kind of comic. He basically told only sexual jokes for like until I think his very last joke, he did some joke about an animal. I can't remember. But um, it was all just like locker room douchebaggery that yeah. you could tell he had done in a bunch of really like male clubs where, <gasps> where, where it had gone off well, yeah, but sure. like, it was so weird to watch this guy do a set that he's expecting to kill, I guess, much like my Renfrew fucking show. <laughs> but, yeah. um, yeah, it was just like, I, I don't know how you can still keep the engine going when you're saying all this demeaning, you know, super fucking horrible shit about women and, like, I don't know, it was just fucking gross. Like, even as a guy with a bit of that, and, you know, I grew up with some of that humor, so I can appreciate, especially if it's a well-written joke, I can appreciate some of that dickish humor to an extent. But, like, how you can keep laying down joke after joke when people are looking at you like you just raped someone based on, like, how uncomfortable you're making everybody. Like, his jokes would start, like, you know, when you like wiping your dick off on the chick's lips or something, yeah. it would like literally those were like his lead ins, not to be gross now, but. But it was, and then, very it was and yeah, like, was well, no good follow up either. They, were, they weren't funny, but it was just fucking mind blowing to me that someone could go on and on and not see like what a fucking asshole you sound like right now. Um, but then apparently some of the girls we came with, they said that he was being just as much of a dick. Like when they were out having smokes, he was being super, Hey, Hey lady. And, or no, he called her a broad or something. He was just one of those fucking guys, you know? But, uh, anyways, <laughs> Montreal was awesome. I really enjoyed that just for last trip. Like, you know, we went as like, kind of like couples and we, uh, shared a vehicle out there and you guys, well, and we would go get high on the roof. Uh, uh and, uh, roof. yeah, it was really like such a nice, like, you you were saying like did that like inspire you and like i i gotta say like like yes like it, it did to be like oh my god like the, there, there's not only like money to be made maybe potentially if you get super famous one day but like people like look at the crowds of people that are coming here to appreciate comedians and well and to laugh that's the best part about comedy is to i, I love making people laugh it's, it's fun like i i joke around all the time like it's and that's why it's so magical that you still did comedy and tried it when you were really still an amateur, you know, I mean, you still are, but like, oh, yeah. so am I, you know, but I mean, I'm talking real amateur. It's like your third time you're about to do this competition, which is totally different ball game as far as like nerves a bit, because you know, like, Oh, there's stakes here. I can possibly move up. Other people are really want this just as bad as I do. That was my goal, man. Like I, I wanted that, that, 
a bronze medal. That was awesome. Like, I don't but know, you like, had everything with your son going on is, is where I was getting yeah, to. That's why I said like the photo is me, like putting my arm up and like flexing. And it was, it wasn't to like look at my big muscles. It was, I remember uh, I would pull up my sleeves and I would, I would feed my son when we were at Chio and like he'd be, they'd pass you all the wires and all this stuff. And you'd just be able to kind of like hold them and like, yeah, you yeah. showed me a picture and he had like Cerebro yeah, was, on his head. He, he was, yeah, he was all plugged in and stuff like that. So I remember like it, th- that photo was for me. It was like, you did it, man. Like you persevered through the competition and you persevered and you made it through uh, e- even with all the other stuff that was going on at home and at the hospital and everything that, that there was, I, I, I still, I felt very victorious. I was like, yes, my heart. Yeah, man. Crazy. See, that's the thing. Any comic from the local community, just thinking about the fact that that was your third time ever doing comedy, which they may not have known. You made it through in a competition, which they did know. But yeah, then they, on top of that, they, they, really, yeah, like they, they didn't like, know that you were dealing with your son's issues, you know? Correct. Like when I was like emailing Howard Wagman, shout out to Howard Wagman. I'm going to tell a joke about it after. It was like, it, it, was, it was just so nice to to be able to, to be involved in this comedy competition. And I remember just like texting him, and I'm not really good with technology, so I don't know how to use the internet. And I was like emailing him and stuff like that. And he was like, yes, Terry, like you're in. He's like, please stop. It was, it, the email was, uh, please stop. Like you're, you're in the competition. Like, You've asked enough. Cause I was like, uh, I was like, and I, and I took my headshot and I have a friend to bring and I advertised on Facebook. Doop, doop, doop. Like, yeah, that's very normal though, dude. When I first started, I made like business cards and shit within like the first three shows I had done where I was like, Oh yeah, here's my, my oh, non-existent web page. Yeah. yeah, dude, that's, I think, but that's, Birthdays. that's cute though. And that's like, I don't, I hate when people shit on that. Cause it's like, here's someone who's so stoked to be getting into comedy. And then you have these like grizzled veterans that are like, Oh God, I remember when I was that happy. And it's the balance is somewhere in the middle, in my opinion. Like, obviously yeah. you can't be that idiot for the whole time thinking that you're just like, well, I guess I'm on my way to Hollywood. Cause I did three sets, but the, the opposite end of that spectrum is so fucking depressing. The people who haven't made it and they've been at it for too long, respectively speaking, at least as far as where they thought they would be after that long. And those people are so bitter and shitty and all, and they hate the new people the the most. That's what I got a lot when I first started comedy was I came out as this like artsy musical fucking guy, just having fun and the clubs and the audiences loved it. But every, a lot of the comics I met resented the shit out of me. Cause they're like, Oh, you barely practice this. Oh yeah. Fuck you. You're like that lucky, lucky shot, you know, like that kind of shit. And I just got a vibe, not everyone mind you, but I got a vibe that like that whole fucking hierarchy, you need to work up your, your way, which is true, but you don't have to be a dick about it. You know what I mean? That's, that's the caveat there is like, of course, of course you have to work your way up the comedic ladder and, and you're not just going to, you know, jump to the superstar level, but yeah for the for the people who are like more experienced to not remember that in themselves when they started and that enthusiasm that boisterousness like that's so sad to me because you've truly lost sight I no, we're, we're, we're both kind of like I, we're I, we're not both but like where where you're like I, I don't know when my next comedy competition is it's kind of like well that's everyone right I, now I would, for the like to and I, I like the idea of it and I like going up on stage and doing it but like I, I'm a full-time dad now it doesn't mean that I'm not writing down jokes yeah that's the important part keep writing right? yeah like, I'm, I'm writing it all down and if another Mike McDonald's Yuck Yucks comedy competition comes up and I feel like entering and feel like I can maybe get another bronze medal or maybe a silver or something like that. Like go out there and perform again. I, I think that would be a lot of fun. Well, and the competitions are, are honestly designed well because every time I join one, I'm very much the same way where I'm like, you know what? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, another competition. I just kind of sign up just to put that fire under my ass because I know I'll come up with something and I always do. And I've made it to the semis as the farthest I've ever gotten. But every time I get kicked out, eventually I'm always kind of secretly happy because I know that if I somehow fluked and won the competition, they then want you to perform like a weekend of feature acts. And I like, I'd be like, I I don't have enough material. No, like the pay position that they had up for offer at the end, which is like, you know, you get to get a grand. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, it was like, look out. I might win. And I was like, I'm not going to win this. But like, cause if you did, well, I mean, I'm sure again, maybe that would be the bigger fire. Yeah, I did want to be out of the competition. Like, you know, it was on my plate. Like, I was just dealing yeah. with all the chio and stuff like that. And like, it's like 
come on, man. Like, but you're still the guy who got on the plane to go to war. You just were hoping you'd get shot in the leg and sent home. And sent back <laughs> home. Absolutely. But like, I put on that nice brave face and I put my helmet on and I, 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 and I went out there, which is huge. The fact that anyways, I know we've, we've talked about this a lot, but it's, it's to me very cool. And um, the, the long winded point I was actually trying to get to when we were talking about how we like making people laugh as, as yeah. most comedians, I think would, um, is that while you're dealing with that shit with your son, forcing yourself to persevere, maybe distracting yourself to some degree to have another avenue for your brain to just be like, let's fucking do this tonight and not think about this heavy Chio, like my son's in this horrible health condition, whatever. Um, but do, yeah. what about all the people in the audience? You don't know what one of them might be going through, not the same, but some fucked up. Maybe their dad just died. Maybe, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. Like, I, I would love to just put like, Hashtag counseling, hashtag like therapist, hashtag like lactation consultant, like hashtag uh, tongue, lip and tongue tie, like like go go get the help if you need the help. Like if if that would be like a great takeaway from people is to like is to, to get help. It, it it works, you know. Ask for help. It's not weakness. Like it, who cares about the, those gender stereotypes? Like crying oh, at hard to Tracy Chapman. And it's like that's just fine. It's just something for me to talk with uh, Jeff about on one of my counseling things. Uh, another Jeff that was a counselor, I'm just rambling here was uh, the spiritual counseling that we got at Chio it was definitely for me, but like, it was, it was like night and day. It was like, we were saying prayers uh, for Toby to, you know, uh, be happy and healthy and for the surgery and stuff like that. And the next morning, like you asked, uh, they did the x-rays and he didn't need the surgery. So it's like, Damn. fuck, like, like, would you like him baptized? I was like, you got it, Jeff. Like, you know, like to, 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 to make that connection. It was the, I felt really good at, at Chio. You know, the wife wanted to leave and I wanted to stay because she was like, I can take care of him. And I was like, you take care of him. Like, you know, it was such a, a scary point in your life where. Are you a religious dude? I, I not to go off on a tangent, not but particularly, but you were like, raised maybe Catholic. Yeah. Raised, we would go to church uh, every Christmas and we would do the midnight mass and I'm baptized and it's all just kind of, I, I have faith and there's no, no problem with faith of like really any sort. So like just believing in a higher something. Yeah. Like, it's like, Christy isn't even all that religious. And she was like, Oh, like I want to be there. And she would be involved in the prayers. And like, like you, you would feel something. I definitely felt something uh, when, when the prayers would be being said by uh, their spiritual counselor, Jeff at Chio is just like, it, it was really nice to, to have somebody say the words that like you, you're just thinking or that you, you can't think of. And then you just feel them. Uh, I, I'm totally grateful for, uh, you know, to, to have Chio in Ottawa here and to have been lucky enough that like they, they were kind of like ready for him. Like Chio was like, yeah, he's got his heart problem. And then they're like, holy fuck. Like, you know, so, yeah. All the other stuff that ended up yeah, happening. Like, yeah. He was, like, I'm, he was surrounded by so many doctors um, like right away. So it was, it's, dude, man, yeah, I can't even cool. imagine what that was like going through that. Um, it was awful, like and Cr Christy, like, cause I remember you, you like texted or something. You were like, Oh, like congratulations. Cause Christy didn't know what was going on. Like, the, yeah, she put a picture up on Facebook or something that seemed like positive <laughs> or, or something. She gave birth. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm talking with like my pink microphone. I'm, I'm telling jokes and like baby comes out and they're like, cut the cord, fucking cut the cord, cut the cord. And I'm like, cut the cord. And I like look down at like Christy. Cause like they, they give the, the baby to the mother really quick. No yeah. matter what. The bond, and, yeah. And, like, I look away and, and he's gone. And like, there's a nurse that's like, you know, like, okay, come, come with us. And that's, so I left, she was like, yeah, yeah I had a baby. And then they're like, oh my God, like this baby is pretty fucked up. And so she was probably like, yeah, I had a baby. And she posted that. Yeah. It was, it, I mean, it was probably not a photo. Like, it was like a status. Yeah. And I was like, fuck you, man. Like, you know, but like, you know what I mean? Sorry. So upset where I was like, Cause it didn't match. It didn't match what was actually. Yeah. yeah of course you, you didn't know, but like I was in this moment where like doctors like, do you have any questions? And I was like, I, like, is there something wrong with his neck? Like I, I'm so naive at this point of like 
what his problem fucking, was. You guys weren't expecting any of that. You were expecting the heart thing, which you little just found thing. out wasn't going to be a thing. Just a little heart thing, a little, little heart surgery. And then, like, did you say he was, like, gray when he came out or something? So, like, my daughter was an Apgar scale 10. So, like, that's, like... The color? High, uh, it, it, it's based on everything, how well they're breathing, crying. Oh, okay, it, okay. It's, it's a quick way to be, like, uh, is that baby alive? Like, the health so spectrum. Would be yeah. like, <laughs> dead. And he was getting, like, ones. I think he made it up to, like, five. Oh, Jesus. Like, 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 what, like one, one is not good. Like, yeah, of course. Was, uh, was Holy a, fuck. A very, very dark time where, like, I just sat there in the chair, like, 15 feet away and just cried for, like, 10 hours till they, like, put them all back together and stuck enough tubes and wires in to keep them alive. And That's as I said, his, his podcast was uh, stuck in the bed. So they put him on a little ice bath bed to protect his brain so that was his like first three days and was like uh, stuck in the bed like we got hey we got alice today and uh, he's stuck in the bed and he had like helmets and stuff and breathing tubes and the feedings i said were so like complicated i'd like feed him and then it's like oh you didn't give him enough and they like shove the rest out his nose it's so hard to watch man Fuck, man no you like, guys came like, all night I, we had the like the, the gazebo set up in the backyard and you guys um came and played board games outside with us. And it was like, I want to say you guys were on like a break. Like you had had the kid, it had been a few yeah. days and you guys yeah. won. They were like, go leave for a bit, like get some fucking rest or whatever. And you guys yeah. came and hung out. And I remember you breaking down that night too, you know, and, and you were, you were trying to get fucked up a- instead, which I think a lot of people would do in that situation. Just try to uh, yeah. substances to yeah. alleviate the, no, no pain. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah. but it really, in the end, it brought out, what needed to come out like you said much like the tracy chapman song um (laughs) i need to look up that song now i'm not familiar with that song what what is it called drive fast car driving fast everybody in the world knows this song oliver unfortunately i know the give me one yeah fast car i got a ticket to anywhere oh shit i do know that song okay decision it was like yeah i just didn't know what it was called shit that's a great song actually it's a job and like takes care and it's just like ah oh "Oh, you're you're killing me here so but that's like speaking of your your machismo youth though that's like the least masculine thing crying to a tracy chapman song and that's why i feel like i needed to share it that it's like that's okay of course that's beautiful that's that's to show up uh, on time, but take five minutes because I am a cheese mode to kind of like clear yeah. the tears. Yeah, gather back. yourself. Take a good breath and put your mask on and go to work because you still mm. have to go to work. But like, I'm allowed to be sad. I'm allowed to let it affect me. And, you know, like it, who knows why it affected me? Maybe it was, you know, like really feeling bad about my son or like worried about my like marriage and our house and my job. You you had so much stress in in your life at the moment. I I, I had never been like really laid off. And with COVID I got laid off and it was like the first time that I wasn't uh, working, doing, and I'm, I'm very, I I like doing stuff. I like being physical. I was in kitchens for like 15 years of my life. So it's, you stand, you work, you earn your check. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of militaristic. So, yeah. Yeah. That's... It was weird. It was, COVID definitely was no fun. Well, so. it's still not fun, but this is fun. <laughs> oh, I'm having a great time. No, <laughs> man, it's great to talk about all this because if this can help anyone too, much like comedy, if, if, I love how expressing yourself can be a conduit to helping other people that might not be going through the same thing, but just no, similar but emotional that's experiences. That's why I said, like, hashtag counseling for this, hashtag, like, yeah substance abuse like you got problems like like go, go go get some help like i i've been doing nothing but asking for help since like my daughter was born if not yeah. even before and it's just like asking for like a a, a family member to like come in and, and help and and help a lot. Well, like load the dishwasher just do something it's it's nice to have that family bond and and, and the friends that i have have been super supportive like people drove from like Van Cleek Hill to watch me perform at Yuck Yucks. That's like an hour's drive. People in like Canada were like, yeah, man, I'll be at your show. And like, nice. I felt a lot of support, not only like through, you know, all the problems that we've had with, you know, my wife, my first child, my second child. And yeah, it's been a roller coaster you know, for sure. like work. And I just believe that it, it, it's been so much help to get, the counseling to, to talk to people to open up 
Well, uh, and when you're more willing to accept help from other people, it also has this rebound effect of like, you then want to help people. You know what I mean? Like it's this community feeling of like, when someone really helps you and they don't need to, and they're not doing it for personal gain, but they're doing it just to help you mm-hmm. that rubs off on you. And then you go like, Oh, like, so a lot of people need fucking help. Like I can, I can do that. You know, just even the little thing, just like saying fucking hi. Or like when I'm getting my groceries, I just go like, Hey, how's your day going? And most of the time the cashier's like, what the fuck are you talking to me? <laughs> but like, I try still just to be like, you know, let's, let's I, I wave to like, everybody in my neighborhood that's kind of like like they, they know me as the guy who's like he's gonna lift up his hand and he's gonna force me to like acknowledge his presence and i'm like <laughs> hey you're like hello and like yeah. they just have to like look back and you know i i, I want to be that i want to be that dad i want to be 3.5 star dad i'm so happy to to be in a a position a nice neighborhood a good house like close to schools like I was like, I, I don't even care if my daughter goes to school. I'd, I'd love to be able to just kind of like teach her at home and stuff like that. During the pandemic, yeah. Yeah. Well, probably, kindergarten's I, I not... I won't be saying this once I have to like teach her or anything. But. Well, I, I'm in the same boat right now because our son, you know, next September was when he should be going for junior kindergarten. But first of all, I've been told that you don't actually have to do any kindergarten. The kids can just come into grade one Correct. as far as like legally. Correct. Um, but so that's why I'm like, I don't feel like it's a big deal. Like, yeah, you know, I think it's because I those two years, it's like, I'm not trying to diminish kindergarten teachers here, but no. uh, those first two years, if you are interactive parents like us that enjoy that, that experience and it's not a chore, um, like I know colors, I know numbers, I know like letters, I've like I, downstairs, I've got a bag of like 64 different colored Crayola crayons right here. We're going to have a great day. We're going to learn about like all the different letters. So yeah, it's, it's it. well, my, my youngest three and a half and he does the workouts that we do sometimes with us. Like he knows how to plank. I've yeah. seen him try a push up, and he's like three and a half. I can't even believe it. Um, that was what I was trying to get Chloe to do today was, uh, was a push up. Still just a modified one, just like from of the course. Yeah. And stuff like that. But we got this crash mat to do Toby's physio and you know, it's four big sections. I said, you get the red one, he gets the yellow and the blue and I'll take the green one. And we all kind of like did a little exercise and some family. Speaking physio. of um, gender roles and all that, I like that you said yeah. modified push up and you didn't say girl push up because there's so many girls <laughs> who could kick the shit out of me. And they and- would have called it girl push ups in, uh, in Colonel by. It was said, oh, yeah, do, do your girl push-ups. That was a part of the time that we were living yeah, in, too. Correct. But. And, like, there's nothing wrong with just saying modified push-up. It's modified Well, push-up. it's just interesting to look, too, and to acknowledge, like, wow, that is kind of fucked that everybody just said girl push-up, even though there's plenty of girls who are super fit and plenty of guys oh, who can not yeah. even get out of bed in the morning, you know? I could, like, do, do a pull-up. Maybe you're like, I can't do a pull-up. Like, yeah, exactly. For something from Amazon, but I can't do a pull-up. Like, Yeah. Okay, we'll do a girl pull up then. I'm like, no, I still can't do oh, that. What is that? <laughs> I don't know if that's a thing. No, but that's what I'm saying. You could say that to the guy who can't do a pull up and he's still fucked, you know? So it's it's just, I'm happy that some of that language is changing because, like, it's about time, you know? The same thing with the stay at home dad. Like, it's just weird that so many things you you just accept as at face value as being normal, you get a little bit of perspective and then you go, like, wow, that's ridiculous that you know, things have those kind of labels just attached. No, like, I, I, Cause I have to now kind of like rewire my daughter's brain a bit. I think that our daycare, she is like fantastic. It is a private daycare. It is uh, my daughter and the daycare providers granddaughter. Mm. That's it. Or like maybe Luca comes. So like that's the, the son. And so it's three kids. And so like there, it's a very tight, uh, well, as it should be during the pandemic correct yeah, yeah. i don't know man it was we're, we're just we're really lucky that she's so close but she did give her kind of these old school kind of values where she's like oh you know daddy goes to work and yeah and pink is for girls and pink is for girls so we're gonna have to rewrite this because she goes it like she just flipped it right away I said, mommy's going back to work. We've been prepping her. Mommy's going back to work. Daddy's going to be here. Daddy's going to take care of you. And she goes, okay, so uh, daddy, you're mommy now. Hmm. Interesting. Right? So now I'm going to have to deal with that where I'm just going to have to be like, oh, we have a, a good one that we use as, a, as an example all the time is uh, The Incredibles. In The Incredibles, Elastigirl 
gets to go be out in the public face and she gets to save the train and she's the superhero. That's true. And yeah. Mr. Incredible stays home with the kids and takes care of the house. But like they, they both have their jobs and they're both like, that, that's what makes the family work. Right. Yeah. So, Whatever works for your family. And that's yeah. And, and, and to teach, to teach a three-year-old that it's okay for dad to stay home and cook the dinner. And that doesn't make him <laughs> not daddy. He's still uh, Mr. That. Incredible. He's still Mr. Incredible. He's not yeah, Mr. Yeah. Incredible, though. He's Mr. Incredible. So, yeah. Well, and your pizzas are incredible. We should say that. Terry we makes pizza. My pizzas. So, did you he like stuffs the crust? I, I'm, I stepped up my game. I actually am making my own crusts now. So, I make it like basically from scratch. So, I used to buy like the Metro ball of dough and I do a stuffed crust with that. And it's, so good i love making those people I, I just was talking with uh with beth beth was actually here today having uh some birthday burgers and fries nice the number is very small just the one extra guest. um and yeah like fuck it was it was good times uh, you guys had pizza is that what you were uh well sorry the thing about the pizza was <laughs> she, yeah, i know i forgot she was like going through her phone and she's like oh did you know that you can search for things so she could just put chloe and it would show up pictures of her and chloe on her phone and i was like oh that's right i did that with my phone and i typed in the word pizza oh, on shit. My phone, and it just gave me this like littered screen of just all the pizzas that i've made you know the the custom ones for you guys where it's just like no cheese uh, cheese no meats and stuff like that Wait, i don't eat meat Rest. um Correct, but like you've been over for pizzas every time I, I screw it up. Kelly's like, oh, I don't like olives. Well, no, because Kelly, that's the thing. When it comes to pizza, man, <laughs> no, it's so weird. Me and Kelly have so much in common. We're born like four days apart, different years, but we're both Sagittarius. You know, we're both born on a Friday. We just found out too. We have a lot in common as far as interests, but with pizza toppings is like the one thing where she. And me are she and I rather are are just completely different ends. Obviously, the meat thing. Mm -hmm. You would think that meat eating aside, we could agree on some vegetables, but no way, man. I'm pineapples and green olives. I like hot peppers. She yeah. likes mushrooms, which unless they're magical, I'm not usually a fan. Right, and, and like I I love making my pizzas, man. Like as I said, I worked in kitchens for like 15 years. Like it's surprising that it took me this long. It it took to like people making bread when like pandemic bread making became a thing. I was yeah, like, yeah, that was huge. You couldn't get fucking flour for you like, get flour, so I, was like I was like, there's gotta be something to this. You know, maybe one day all the lights are going to turn off and I'm going to have to use my propane stove to make, make pizza, me. but I'll know how to do it. Yeah, right. Yeah. So like, it's, it's kind of nice. I mean, that's true. Oh I'm God. the opposite. I'm the guy who scours the city trying to find new pizza places every week. I love trying new pizza places. And my favorite are like hole in the wall pizza places where you if you drive too fast you won't even see the place because it's so fucking just in an alley uh, they're always the best but yeah super old oven that's like we don't wash it so you're just like oh, yeah. look, did you give it a wipe down they're like yeah no. <laughs> like there's hair in this pizza hair is good for you hair has protein <laughs> Yeah, no, man. Um, well, shit, I don't know. Fuck, we talked about a lot of stuff. That's awesome. Um, I think we honestly went over pretty much everything I was going to bring up in just like the crazy order that I knew it would come up in. So it, it is almost 10 now. We've been going like an hour and a half or something. So this is awesome. But um, let's do the last question that I've been doing this season. Yeah. Like maybe I think, yeah, you watched one this season. You know what it is. Yeah, um, I had to modify my answer, man. I had been thinking about my answer since like you started your podcast. Okay, well, I got to ask the question. I got to ask the question. So people who, because someone might have never heard this show before. And the right. season two question ending, interview ending question, I should say, is if you could have dinner with somebody at any point in history, so it could yeah, be present, yeah. past, future is hard to guess, but uh, that you've never met before, living or dead, who right, would right. it be and why, if you can elaborate? Absolutely. So it's like, I, I don't, nobody's going to like come up with this, like people and people are going to come up with better ones, but I, I, I like this one personally. It's, I, I would go have dinner with Peter Cunningham. He's a, he's a race car driver. Exactly. It's like so oh, just like random, so like so niche. Yeah. Exactly. I would go back to like 2002 and I would be like, well, what was it like to win, you know, like the, the championship race in your like 1998 Honda Integra Type R? Like, tell me about that. I, I, I can't not even speak to this. I, I have no be, idea who this guy is. Right. But cars, cars mean something to yeah, me. Yeah. Uh, that that's just that is who 
I would like to have dinner with. Just, That's totally just, okay. That's just awesome. Random and, just, and he'd be like, who are you? And why are you eating dinner with me? And I'd be like, tell me more about the cars. Yeah, you'd be like, I don't want to know about you. I just want to know about your car. Exactly. Uh, so like, and, and like, I don't know. It was, it was kind of like he drove this like small little front wheel drive four cylinder car against like rear wheel drive BMWs. And it, 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 it won, it won four years in a row. Like it was just like this, Shit. It, it hadn't happened before. And I'm not sure if it has happened since where like, they just, just won all these races. Gotta check it out on YouTube. Yeah. I'm not yeah. big into racing because I I think yeah. I rebelled against things that I saw as stereotypically male and definitely cars and automotive and mechanics was definitely one of those things, you know? Yeah. But watching you... trucks and watching NASCAR and, and watching British touring car championships and watching these racing like programs, it was just so entertaining and it, it brought so much passion. I'm pretty sure you even asked me at some point in your house, you were like, if you could have any car that you ever wanted. And I was like the 1998 Integra type R. And you're like, I didn't know what that was. Well, I mean, I know an actor Integra, but it's, yeah. it's just, and my wife's like, what, like, like, why do you want I'm like, you could have a Maserati. You could have you like, have, you could have a Pagani Zonda. You could have a, a Lamborghini. You could have a, a Ford Mustang, but like Damn. something to me wants that achievableness. Like nowadays it's like a, a $70,000 collectible car and it's, it's very niche but like you can still go on auto trader and buy one for like two and a half grand. Oh shit. And they're not the exact. Whatever it's, though. Yeah. You, you can the, achieve that dream, Derry. Correct. And I, it, it's truly, I want it to be kind of like my daughter's dream. I would like for my daughter and me to maybe like one day wrench on a car that she could drive when she's 16 or 18 or whenever she wants to start driving and experience a manual transmission. I think that that's something nice. that like, and, and, and that's and again her, bending her gender roles. stereotypes exactly yeah. I, I want her to have that experience i want i, I joke to the wife i say uh, i want her boyfriend to be like what's that third pedal for i want him to be the one that's like i'm right, just driving automatic and she's like let me put it in gear for you and you're, yeah but you know that's not going to happen because she's probably going to think that that's lame because she's going to be so into the cars and the manual because of how you're raising or you want yeah. to raise her that she's yeah. going to if she sees a guy who drives manual, she's instantly going to find him way more attractive. I would think probably, but like in this theoretical, like, Oh my God, we, we gave my daughter like theoretical boyfriends ever since she was born. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard not to man. It's, yeah. I mean, your, your kid's still young. Your oldest is like the same age as my youngest. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually starting to hit the other end of that where my oldest is now like 12 Ooh, daughters, so 10. I'm fast. like, yeah. I'm like years go pretty fast. As far as the last few have all of a sudden, I'm going to have two kids in high school that are fucking hormonal and, uh, you know, getting physically involved with other people's kids that aren't really kids. They're all adolescents now. It's just, Oh man, all that shit yeah. makes me so uncomfortable as a parent. Yeah, and I need to get over it. now that's why like I gave her like the fake boyfriends and stuff, man, just like get angry at the fake boyfriend. Now his name is Marcus. Nobody likes Marcus. Like <laughs> Marcus is kind of a douchey name. Yeah. Marcus is a douche. He has three guitars at home. None of which have enough strings to even put one working guitar together. Like, no, that's a great joke. Oh Marcus, my God. <laughs> Marcus's parents don't even like Marcus. And we're like, oh, why is Chloe in love with this guy? So, like, get, get ready to, to hate that boyfriend, to just be like, oh, you are just liquid garbage. And dude, this is why you're going to be so good if you keep doing comedy, because that right there was like, you painted a picture in my mind of this guy named Marcus, and the Marcus, guitar the comment was three broken guitars. Hold on. Um, man, thank you so much for, uh, hanging out. Not that I don't want to do this with you on some time where we're not recording it. it yeah, yeah, we, no, we, I mean, we talked with you and the wife, like what, a couple of weeks ago. And that was a blast. Yeah, too. It, it's true. You guys kept holding your phone. You're like, yeah. are you going to hang up sooner? I was like, no, we got a lot to talk about. So like, I we put just, all the money in the podcast studio and I didn't get a fucking tripod for my phone. You didn't, you didn't get a tripod for your phone. So next time get a tripod for your phone. And uh, yeah, man, this has been so much fun. I'm really, really happy that you let me on with only having done like four comedy shows. And oh, just dude, I never that. ever wanted this show to be about that because I started with a bunch of comics on this show just because I wanted people I knew would be interesting that wouldn't be afraid of a microphone and have, you know, cool stories to tell. But all I've ever wanted to do since, which I've tried to do is expand to just people from all walks of life because everybody has a story to tell. And you can learn something from every person you meet. And I want to talk to scientists and historians and, uh, you know, fucking name it. 
if it's something I don't know how to, a firefighter, like that would be fucking awesome. Like I've been really enjoying your podcast. Like I haven't seen them all. I can honestly say that, but like that's more than okay. The one with like uh, Hal Johnson and Joe. I'm glad to see the one with the guys from Degrassi. You, you and Christy used to get high and watch Degrassi all the time. And so, dude, it's it's been a trip, man. To be able to be like my friend Oliver George gets to hang out with the people that he used to watch on TV. Like so many at this point, people that I I never thought I would talk to, let alone. I don't want to say befriend, but like at least Stacy from Degrassi, um, Caitlin from Degrassi. Like yeah. I feel like she's a friend now. We've we've had a lot of great exchanges since, and and none of it feels dependent on the interview. You know, it's like that's over, and we're still you know um, really friendly now. So it, it's so cool, man. Um, but that being said, big names or not big names, like firefighter, plumber, whatever. I just like meeting people that have such a different perspective and such a different, um, you know, viewpoint and just way of living than me, because I think that that's, that's, if we could all just do that and, and just chill with somebody that maybe is from a different walk of life, you're going to benefit from that experience. And they probably will as well, as long as you're not a piece of shit. Um, so, you know, like I don't, I don't come into interviews thinking I'm going to, you know, people are going to walk away being like, wow, he was, I really glad I talked to that host. There's something about being an interviewer. You recognize that they're the special person. You know, I'm, I'm interviewing, you're the guest. I, I'm not trying to take that away, but nevertheless, I get interactions where I go like, Oh, I think they actually really did like how I came off. Or like, they told me I made them feel like an old friend or something like that. And I don't know, the whole thing is positive. And even during COVID it's, it's, it's been a, a light in the darkness, you know? So yeah. No, this was great too. As much as we've had so many normal conversations, not being interviewed, it was cool to do it like this too. So I'm really glad you came on, man. I, I wrote down my notes. I was feeling excited that I got to like be on the show and uh, I think it went pretty well. Like, no, this was super fun. I think that anyone who listens to this will be able to tell that we're honestly best friends and that this is all yeah. real talk. And um, I hope that, three years from now you're like crushing it on the comedy scene and this will be that interview people are watching when they oh terry yeah yeah this is when he didn't even really have much credit you know right i would like to do the old answer as well i don't know if people are going to accept that but i would like to say the superpower one okay <laughs> wow so terry is going back to season yeah. one where at the end of season one i would ask everybody what superpower they would want if they could be endowed with one so i'll allow it i'll allow it <laughs> there we go so I'll, I'll go with both genders to just make this as fair as we can go. I'm going to say Helen Parr and Reed Richards. You might get that one. Reed Richards. What was the first name? Helen Parr. Who's Helen Parr? Helen Parr is Elastigirl. And Mr. Oh, Fantastic okay, okay. Reed Richards. So I would like, like stretch powers. Like it just seems like it'd be like incredibly convenient. You could, you know squirm to the side and dodge bullets you could reach out real far and punch somebody you could turn your finger into key and like unlock a yeah. door turn yourself into a parachute it it, it leads itself to, to so many useful There's a lot of possibilities a lot of possibilities i feel like it would be a beneficial superpower so i wonder else, can can stretchy be i guess they can always alter their appearance essentially to whatever they want because as far as I remember, even in old comics, Mr. Fantastic could like change his face to look like somebody else through that yeah, power. Cool. Cause I was going to say, um, I could see a lot of stretchy power people being super lazy and being like, Oh, more chips. And then like yeah. they just get that belly coming in, <laughs> but no, I guess they could just suck it in and malleable everything. So it doesn't really matter. That's a cool answer though. I don't know that we ever got that before. And I, everyone's going to make the dick joke though. Like, Oh, you want to add a couple inches or whatever, but I didn't say it. You know that that's low hanging fruit. Yeah, it's true. I said it. I, I chose I to not say it. I said finger as a key. And I said parachute. I, I easily could have said penis. So I think that's why people might've not chosen that in the past though, is because there's always that penis association. If you're a guy well, saying it, like it for, for me, it was, it was always a, it was, it was going to be like Elastigirl. I, I see in the, the Credibles, we've got to watch Credibles. The Incredibles on TV is like, she had this phase where she just watched The Incredibles all the time. And so it, it's, it's fine. It's a, a female with a superpower. If, if I want to, if I want my superpower to be Ellen, uh, Helen Parr superpower versus Reed Richards, I think that that's well, just it's the same superpower, but I get the point you're making. Yeah. So, 
That's funny. I got to say the the funniest, well, not funniest, but the most honest and quickest answer I ever got to that question that definitely made me laugh was um, Graham K. He's, he hesitated for a moment and then he just went, oh, x-ray vision. Is it like <laughs> boobies <laughs> or something like that? And it was such a simple, clean, funny. Oh, man, that guy's hilarious. Anyways, um, thank you again, dude. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk yeah. very soon. Yeah. And this will be up uh, in two days on Monday. So, you know, share it around if you want. I'll post it. I'll share it. I'll do all that fun stuff. Thanks, man. Awesome, dude. Get a good sleep. I know we're past your bedtime. (laughs) Peace. Yo, peace, dude.